hey, Shelby, this is Mrs. Giroux, and I know I got your email yesterday, and I sent you a response back, but I also wanted to make this video for you to ensure that you have a full understanding of what I meant in that email now that I've had some time to make it for you. All right, so I'm at the class homepage right here, and it shows that your grade is 62%, and I know that you were wondering, well, how could I only have a D when I only have one overdue? This is why I probably um, have discussed it in several of the videos that I've sent and asked you to watch, that you do not pay attention to the overview overdue because you'll notice down here it says that you've only completed 89% of the class. The required topics completed is 129 out of 144. So if you've only completed 89% of the class, then how can there only be one overdue? So I'm not sure how this uh, program calculates that. That's why I just ask you to ignore that. What you need to do is go into your gradebook, and you do that by clicking on grades. And you can see that you've got some low scores here. So a 50 out of an 80, a D, you're never gonna get an A in a class if you're getting C's and D's on your, on your tests and on your assignments. Um, and you've got to come in here and make sure that you read my feedback. Hi, Shelby, great job getting this submitted. Here's how the rubric looks. The things that are missing are in red. I recommend that you watch these two video tutorials that'll show you how to do those skills and then you can resubmit for credit, right? Good job getting that Friday bell work in. Um, and then on the next week, you've got a test that has a zero. So this one hasn't even been taken. This is a low score. Now, you should not be getting low scores on tests, and I'm going to show you why in a minute. If you're getting low scores on tests, that tells me that you're really not giving it your best effort and that you're not following the directions that I put in there on how to take the tests in the class, and I show that to you in the videos that I've sent you. Um, this is a low test score uh, test on vector versus graphic. Um, good job on this assignment. Awesome. And um, then we have, let's see... Um, feedback on your um, your Friday bell work, which you got a perfect score on. Awesome job. Um, and then there's a critique, good score on that one. And um, all of these other things, pretty good score. This one right here could probably have been better. Um, and then you have a zero out of 100 on this assignment. Says, I love your caption, what a powerful intention. According to the Inkscape file, the work was not created in Inkscape, but rather pasted in. It's important to use the Inkscape tool to create your product, especially the pencil tool, which is demonstrated in the week five lesson. So this week five lesson is important that you do that. Um, and not only just skim through it, but you really need to get your Inkscape program out and practice using the pencil tool while you're watching that tutorial because you need to learn those skills in order to be able to complete the assignment. So it's a great place to start, it says. So here's your work right here, and you needed to create a herring style artwork that is just unmistakably and precisely in the style of his work, right? So notice that Herring's characters and objects are boldly outlined. Look how bold they are. And you, your outlines are super thin. This heart doesn't have one. And it's not smooth. It's a little bit um, edgy. Uh, watch the video that illustrates how to use the pencil tool in a week five lesson. If you practice that, um, you're going to get nice, bold, smooth lines, okay? Notice even the page has an outline on Herring's work, okay? So you could have a page on yours as well. And he always has a horizon line, it seems like. This one happens to be water, but it could be a straight line. And the foreground and the background are generally different colors. So notice his use of color as well. So just learn to use that pencil tool to get nice, smooth these gesture lines as well. Your gesture lines are there, but they're rickety, they're thin, um, they're not smooth. You can use that pencil tool to get a really nice effect. You're just gonna have to actually watch the tutorial and practice. So here's um, some other scores. Good job on those ones. And um, there's an assignment that's missing and there's a critique. And if you've done that and it just hasn't been graded, that's why you have a low score. So where does all this come from? It comes from the content. And at first I wanted to look at that week three test that was in there. That was the one on um, the vector and graphics, or vectors and raster graphics. So this is, uh, let's follow the directions. It says to right click on the week three test and open it in a new window. So I'm gonna do that right now. Okay, so boom. Opening that test up in a new window. Okay, that's done. It says take the test as you watch the short video, the difference between raster and graphics. So I'm gonna slide this over a little bit so I can watch both my video and take my test at the same time. 
So the first question on my test is, which type of image is made up of square pixels arranged in a grid? So like it says, watch the video at the same time. So I'm gonna open up the video now, and I'm gonna press play. Hello and welcome to a Tuts Plus Quick Tip Screencast. My name is Cheryl Graham, and in this video, I'm gonna talk about the difference between vector and raster files when it comes to digital graphics. You've surely heard these terms before, and you've probably worked with them as well. But you may wonder which format you should use when. And even if you're an old hand with vectors and rasters, you still may be at a loss to explain the difference to other people. So I hope this will clear some things up for users of all levels. So let's get started. A raster image is made up of square pixels arranged in a grid. Okay. So did you catch that? She said a raster image is made up of square pixels in a grid. The question was what type of image is made up of square pixels arranged in a grid? A raster image, right? So then the next question, photographs are what type of graphic? All digital photographs, for example, are pixel-based raster images. All, pix all photographic images are pixel-based raster graphics, right? So, boom. Now, if you didn't catch it, you can always rewind it. Now, the beautiful thing about these tests is they go in the same order as the videos, so you can just watch, pause, answer questions, read the next question, watch, pause. If you're doing that, there's no reason why you shouldn't be getting an A on every single one of your tests. Getting low test scores tells me that you're not actually doing this, right? Okay, so let's take a look um, at our next item. You can go, you can follow the breadcrumb trails back if you want to. Um, so let's go in there. And the next direction says to watch the week three video lessons. You don't need to memorize everything, but use them as a reference for your week three assignment to help you with your design. It looks like a lot of videos, but they're all short. Complete the K-12 lesson, Shape and Color. So here's all those week three video lessons. And you it looks like you watch them, which is great. But um, whether you watch them and just watch them or watch them and actually thought, hmm, maybe I'll open up my Inkscape file and I'll practice a couple of the things that I learned in those videos, um, that could make a difference in how well you do on your assignments, right? Um, and then here's that test, and it looks like you do really well when you have just a read, answer, question, read, answer, question style. You're good with that. Um, and then that week five lesson and test that was talked about in that herring assignment that you did. Um, this video right here, How to Use the Pencil Tool by V. Scorpion, is really important for you to um, practice. Notice the directions on here say to right click on the week five test and open it in a new window. Bam, so you're gonna do it just like you did the last one. Take the quiz as you watch the videos. Then you'll go down the list and you'll watch each video as you take the quiz because the questions on the quiz go in the same order as the videos, okay? Then it says to open Inkscape and practice the tools illustrated in the tutorial and think about how you will use them to create either a Bridget Riley Op Art inspired artwork or a Keith Haring Pop Art inspired artwork for the week five of seven assignment and then to complete the K-12 lesson on lines, which you're good. You're good at those lessons. Um, you're good at that. And you can be good at the other things too. You just gotta make sure that you're applying yourself and getting in there. So this is the tutorial um, on how to use the pencil tool that it says to make sure that you open up your Inkscape and that you practice it. Um, you're not gonna just learn it by watching it, okay? Inkscape is not that easy. You've gotta actually open up your Inkscape document and get in there and practice, and this is what I mean by that. Hello and, and welcome to this Inkscape tutorial created by me, V. Scorpion C. And this tutorial I will be showing how to use the pencil tool to ink or trace over an image and then fill it in with color. If you look over here I have several different layers for my different parts of this uh, image here. And 
basically if we turn this off that one's going to go away because I have that as one complete object and obviously the boots are on that layer and if we go here we see that there are different parts on this character and I like to do it this way because it makes editing the individual parts easier so that's what we'll be taking a look at and this is based on a image that is a free reference image from the-blueprints.com so what I'm going to do is close this out and I'm going to actually delete these and we have a fresh canvas and I'm going to go to file import and import the image and we'll start with that so when I click this it's going to take me to my window for my directory so I can find my image so I will do that and be right back okay so once you uh, select your image and you click on OK to open it or import it you will see this little box and I'm going to leave this on embed so the actual image is embedded in my canvas here and link is just going to put a reference it'll put the image but it's only a reference to the image on your hard drive so we're going to leave it on embed and click OK and there's my image now the next thing I want to do is I want my image to fit in my page. Now I know already that this image actually does, but what I'm going to do is show you how to fit it if it is not the actual size. So let's say for example this is a smaller image and what I want to do is go to my page properties or document properties. So the first thing that you want to do um, when you're using Inkscape is go ahead and save whatever you're doing. Um, the reason for that is because um, it's going to use a lot of your workable memory. So for me, it'll kind of crash for a minute. You'll notice I couldn't get a hold of it. Um, I'm going to hold down Shift and I'm just going to resize mine, but I'll have to click Save several every single time because it just uses so much workable memory. Oh, actually, you know, I'm going to hit Control Z um, because I just realized I need to hold Control, not Shift. So Control is going to maintain the properties of the size of it instead of um, skewing it. So holding Control and, ooh, I just lost it down there. Press Save. So every single time, I know I have a lot of students that are like, Inkscape crashes my computer. And yeah, um, just click Save and then it should give you some workable memory. But let's go ahead and take a look at what she um, had set up here in her video. And in here we have resize page to content. So whatever we have size. So let's say for example this is a smaller image and what I want to do is go to my page properties or document properties and in here we have resize page to content so whatever we have selected which I have this selected and we use our selection tool click on the object and that's a selection but normally when you embed it it will automatically be selected so if I go here and open that up, I can click repa uh, repage, resize page to drawing or selection. And that's going to resize. Okay, so I'm not going to actually do that because what will happen then is my page will be too big. Um, so because mine's bigger, I just need to get mine sized down. So let's see if I can figure out a way to get that sized Yeah, there's probably a, a way to do it, and it's just not coming to me right now. So I'm just going to continue doing it with the method that I had started with, which is just to resize it by hand. It's going to take a second for the memory to catch up. sure if it's actually getting smaller <laughs> it should be 
Yes, it is. Let's just take it a minute. It's a pretty big picture. Yep, it's getting there. This is it, getting there. Okay, so here's the image that I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna go ahead and say save. And now my canvas is way over here somewhere. So I'm coming over to find my canvas. There it is. Did I find it? Should be around here somewhere. I think this happens to students when I, when they turn stuff in and I can't find their canvas. <laughs> I'm like, where's your work? Okay, well, here's where then we could go ahead and um, use her advice and take our object and um, now we can make the canvas fit the object, right? So let's see if we can do that. I'm just gonna bring it all the way over to the left corner. And my computer is really struggling because of the fact that I'm making a video, so. All right, well, if you ever run into an issue like this, just bring it up to the top left because then it'll be easy to find it in the window, right? Okay, so there it is. Now that I've got that there, um, this is, I'm just gonna use this as the image that I'm gonna trace. So I'm gonna just continue watching her video. Size the page if the page was a different size. And basically what that did is just move my page or canvas over to my object. And then the next thing we're gonna do is use layers. So in here, I have all the layers that I actually started with previously. So I'm going to open up my layers panel. Shortcut is shift control L and we get this. So I'm going to just delete all these layers. Just delete, 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 delete. And I'm going to leave that because you always have to have your background layer, which is going to be that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is double click and I'm going to rename this background BG for background. And then what I like to do is I add in a new layer and I just... And when you do hit BG for background, you have to hit the enter key. If you hit tab or anything like that, it won't save the name. I call it lines because I draw all my lines on one uh, like temporary layer. So I'm going to just add it and it comes in above. On this layer here, I'm going to lower the opacity because I don't need it that dark. And then I'm going to lock it. And what locking it does is it keeps it there so you can't make any changes. And that's what we want to start off with. Now we're going to talk about the pencil tool. There's several different ways you can do your inking. I'm going to make sure I'm on this top layer. But with the inking uh, pen, pencil tool, because we also have the path tool and the calligraphy brush. So in here, I'm going to click this to put that back to the default settings. Now everything up here is options for the tool that we have selected. See that right there. So whatever we select, it will change the options. So these are the pencil tool options. We have bezier curves, which we can draw basic bezier curves and spirals. Um, we're going to use bezier because that's what we're going to trace with. We wouldn't want to trace over this with spirals. And then smoothing is going to determine how smooth your lines are and how many nodes are on that line. So when you have this low, let's just do an example here. Um, one other thing I want to mention is I am using a graphic tablet. Now for your graphic tablet, let's just go over that real quick. Under File, and you go to Input Devices, and you notice how mine shows the tablet that I'm using. Now initially this will not have this information here. Hardware there, so we don't really if you have too many nodes to really deal if you've ever tried to use the pencil tool, you might uh, get something, say you draw and you're trying to draw a curve and it looks okay. And then you go to your path editing tool and you have a bunch of nodes. So when it comes time to edit this, then you have too many nodes to really deal with. There's just way too many. And if we look down on the bottom here, we can see there's 46 nodes on that. Okay, so you'll notice that I kept trying to draw and nothing was happening. And the reason why 
is because my background was selected and it's locked and I can't make any changes to that. What I had to end up doing is going over to my lines layer, because that's the layer that I'm trying to draw in. And so now that I do that, I can go ahead and I can draw the lines like she was talking about. And to see those nodes, you have it selected and you click on this button right here and it shows them all. So that's what she was talking about when she said that smooth level is really low and you're gonna get a ton of nodes. And it also just looks really rickety, right? And you want your lines to look smooth. So this is good that you practice that so you can see what she's talking about because now she's gonna explain how to make your lines look smooth. A very short line, so just imagine uh, tracing over this entire character and have <laughs> God knows how many uh, nodes. Now, before we continue, I just want to talk about the nodes real quick. On any path, you're going to have a node, which is these little marks here. And this is a node. And a node is going to be the point between uh, the lines. And it's going to either be an end node or an end, end node or a node on the path. And when it's on the path, that line is going to run through it. These handles are going to determine how you can edit your nodes. And this here handle, if we mouse over, you can look down here and it'll tell you what kind of node, and that's a smooth node. So you can actually adjust this using a smooth transition between the node and the handles. Uh, the smooth nodes are independent as far as the length. Now if we mouse over this and we go up here, we can switch this to a corner node, which is actually called a cusp node. This one here is the smooth node that we already have. This one here is going to be a symmetric. This is going to make all the selected nodes smooth. And then we have some line segments and different uh, curves that we can make. These we're not going to worry about. So just this here, if you want to change this to a cusp, you can click this or you can do Shift C. A cusp node, if we look down here when I mouse over, notice it's changed is going to give you two independent handles and you can make sharp turns as you see there so this here section or where the line passes through is not necessarily going to be smooth unless you smoothen it out yourself using the handles that are on that particular node Okay. and then the symmetric is very similar to the smooth let's just use this the shortcut for the symmetric is shift Y and now we have symmetric so these handles are going to always remain the same and that's the only difference between smooth and symmetric is that the handles uh, length is going to be symmetric and this transition in here is always going to be smooth so we have three different remove it okay we'll then delete the both of them and the next one is if you put it up too high and then you draw, say we draw a squiggly line, it is set to such a smooth setting. We only have two nodes, the top and the bottom, the end points, and we have no curve in here. We can adjust this, but it's only going to give us the basic kind of S curve because we don't have enough nodes. We can always double click and add one, but it's going to, if you trace over an area like this, which is very curvy and around the chin, it's going to give you a straight line, so that's not ideal. So the best setting, let's just delete that under the pencil, is the smoothing. I usually go about 45 to 50, somewhere in between there. So we'll go about 45, and that's usually pretty good. All right, All right so now we're going to use Bezier and a smooth setting of 45. Now the shape is the shape of the tip of your pencil. None is the one I like to use, and the reason is if you look over here, these settings I'm not going to get into. Uh, we're going to not worry about that. Maybe I'll explain it in a future tutorial because I will be doing uh, more on Inkscape. But for this, I'm not going to worry about that. What I want you to pay attention to is the shape. None is just a basic shape. And when you use none, although it says no fill and stroke set to one here, it's not quite what you might think by default. Under stroke here, it's set to one. And we can actually increase the width of this line by Sorry, I forgot to mention, um, I, I didn't have my video on, but you can right click. That's how you get these. You right click to change the size of the stroke. So you just saw me doing all of that without talking. I'm going to just um, select it all and hit the, my delete key. 
but you'll notice, whoops, got my selection tool, I need my pencil. See how many times I have to save? I've got my smoothest set to 45, my shape's at none, and I can go ahead and I can start tracing around my snowman. I'm just gonna go all the way out. Okay, and I end at that spot. There's my, um, there's my snowman trace, and I can right click down here and I increase that line. Notice that, beautiful. Hold down my control key to make dots, right? And I can increase those dots, file, save. Um, I'm just gonna select it and then I'm going to um, hold down control key and blow it up. And I'll do this other one. Hit save again. There it goes, hold down my control key because that's gonna keep it a circular shape. And there's my other dot, right? So um, look at how cool that is that I can just uh, do that so easily. I'm gonna go ahead and save again and try to select that shape and I'm gonna fill it with a color. So that's fill right now, it says none, but all I have to do is click some color down here. So. I might go for a Keith Haring inspired bright yellow snowman. Let's see if I can get it to work because, um, yeah, there it goes. So all I had to do was fill it. Um, if you want to change the color of your lines, which you probably won't because Keith Haring's lines are usually black, um, but you can by, um, by holding down shift. When you hold down shift, that changes the line, okay? That's something that you learned about in that first, uh, the video that I told you to watch, um, it showed you how to do all that kind of stuff. Uh, when things aren't working for me, I just hit save. I'm gonna go back and change that to black again by holding down shift. Um, I wanna get that um, rectangular outline. I am gonna use my pencil tool just because of the fact that I feel like Keith Haring's uh, drawings are hand drawn and so, one way to do it could have been um, to just draw a rectangle around it, or you could do it by hand. Um, so that's what I'm gonna kinda do here. I'm just drawing my rectangle around this shape, and it's not gonna be perfect, but that's okay because, um, oops, I'm gonna hit escape. Um, control Z, because I think I missed my button. You have to, You have to connect it at the same spot. There we go. Okay, and so I can go ahead and I can increase that one to eight. There's my nice outline, and then I can fill that in with a pretty color. And come to think of it, I should probably be doing that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and control, uh, control X to cut that, and I'm gonna create a new layer, and I'm gonna call that um, the background color, and hit enter. And the background color I wanna be behind the snowman, so I'm gonna lower that a layer. Um, if it doesn't work there, like mine won't, just because um, of the fact that I'm making a video and it just doesn't like it when I do too much stuff. But I've got that background color layer and I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control V to paste that down. And then I can use, um, just select it. Okay, let's save again. I'm gonna select it and I'm gonna use Shift and I'm gonna arrow it down. If I don't use Shift, it just arrows a little bit at a time, so hold Shift and use the arrows on my keyboard to move it over where I want it. And now I can go ahead and fill that in with um, one of Keith Haring's awesome colors, right? Just by clicking down here. So he does that color a lot, right? And I think I'm gonna go ahead and do another layer. Hit save. And if, um, yep, yeah, I'm gonna call this my foreground, okay, color. And that foreground color, yeah, I want it to be on top of my background color, so that's a good place for it. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and once again use my pencil tools and make sure I'm in that layer and I'm gonna draw my foreground. So it's gonna kinda, oops. I didn't do such a great job on that because <laughs> my line went over there, but I can change that. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna increase the width of that line and I'm gonna fill it in with red because that's one of the colors that Keith likes to use. So um, this is a great place to use my nodes so um, I can go ahead and I'm gonna just delete this node. Um, just select it and hit, oops, Control Z, bring it back. Let's go ahead and this node, I'm just selecting that and hitting delete and that gets rid of that node. This one down here, um, I can just 
I know it's not working very well for you because uh, making a video, but I can just kind of play around a bit. I might have to use my handles to get this curve out of that. And then I can drag this over here and I still have a little bit of curve there that I don't really want there. There we go, that's better. So this is a reason why um, getting out your Inkscape and playing around with it is so important. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just click on that and I'll click outside so that I don't have that selected. So look at how Keith Herring that is. It hasn't taken me very long. This is my awesome little yellow snowman and the only thing I'm missing are my gesture lines. So now I'm going to do that and get those gesture lines going. Okay, and, uh, and they're nice and smooth. Um, I do need to increase the width on all of them, so I can do that at one time. I just grab my select tool, so select, and I'm just gonna draw around all of those lines at one time. They're all selected. Right click down here and change them all to eight. So um, look at that. That is unmistakably Keith Herring, isn't it? Another thing that Keith likes to do is put little funny shapes um, in around. So I could um, take each of those, I can select them all, and I can fill those all with a different color. What's another Keith Herring color? He does a lot of pink. I have to hit save before it'll do it. So let's change those to pink. So there we go. I could fill that whole little area with pink get my gesture lines going all around. Um, another thing that would probably be unmistakably Keith Herring would be to put a heart. So I could actually draw a little heart inside and um, I can increase the width of that to eight. And it's, it's behind. So um, I need to go ahead and control X and I need to create a new layer and I need to call that my heart. And that heart needs to be above my, which I should rename that snowman layer. And I'm gonna move that up, okay? And it doesn't wanna move with the arrows. Yours will, mine just won't because um, I'm making a video. And uh, let's see here. Now I can, um, got my heart layer, control V, paste my heart in there, and I can hold my shift and arrow it over where I want. Gotta select it first. Save. <laughs> okay, and then arrow it over where I want it. There we go. And now I'm going to fill that in with pink. There. Look at that. And it wouldn't be complete if I didn't have some cute little gesture lines right around the little heart. Yeah, so then I'm going to take my select tool and I'm going to select all my little gesture lines at one time and I will increase those to eight. And notice it's starting to look like a very Keith Herring image, right? So I know that I spent a lot of time on that, but that's because I care about you and I want you to do well. So now that you could finish watching this video and finish practicing, or you might get to a point in the video where you feel like, all right, I've got enough, I'm ready to go and do that assignment. And that's how this class works. So have a great day.